The Mamluk Sultanate of Egypt is most well known for its famous victory over the Mongols at Ain Jalut in 1260, and the ferocity of its warrior sultan Bebaz al Bundukadari. What receives less attention is the messy and complex way in which the Mamluks came to power in Egypt, a bloody political battle involving Ayyubids, Turks, Crusaders, and of course the Mongols. In this video, we examine the rise of the Mamluk Sultanate. This video is made available for free thanks to our YouTube members and patrons. We fund our free content through our program of exclusive videos made for our members and patrons, who get two documentaries per week not available to the public. We've got a growing collection featuring the First Punic War, the History of Prussia, the Italian Unification Wars, and a review of the classic text Xenophon's Anabasis. We're now covering the Russo-Japanese War and Albigensian Crusades, not to mention our massive Pacific War week-by-week -week coverage, and a massive pool of other projects. All this is made for and with generous donations from our backers. So if you're enjoying our content and want to see more and support the cause of history, consider becoming a YouTube member or patron. You'll also get early access to public content, a spot in our lively Discord server, and behind-the-scenes info and goodies. We rely on our backers to support our growing team pumping out these videos, so thank you to everyone already involved, and we hope you'll consider joining in too. First, it is important to understand what a Mamluk actually was. A Mamluk was, in essence, a slave soldier most usually children of non-Arab and non-Islamic origin who were purchased as slaves and then raised to be a professional military caste, well trained and well provided for, in service to a lord. Before the 13th century, they were most commonly called Ghulams and were a common feature of Islamic armies, often forming their core and elite units. The institution is perhaps most known to European audiences in the form of the famed Genissaries of the Ottoman Empire. These slave soldiers were often seen as the most disciplined and reliable parts of many a conqueror's army, generally seen as more trustworthy than Ghazi, nomadic or other feudal elements of the army, including the ruler's own sons, who it was thought would put their own interests before those of the ruler. In contrast, these slave soldiers were idealized to be utterly loyal only to the monarch, though the reality was often different. No shortage of Islamic princes lamented how their Ghulams or Mamluks tended to be more loyal than their own sons. The sons awaited only the death of the father for a chance to succeed him, while the Ghulams wanted only his glory. Famously, the childless Ghurid Sultan Muhammad of Ghor is supposed to have remarked that while other monarchs could have a few sons, he had thousands in the form of his Ghulams. Various Islamic states from the 11th century onwards looked to the Turkic peoples of the Great Eurasian Steppe as a source for these slaves. Having already horse and archery skills from their youth made these boys ideal candidates. Through raids, warfare, or due to poverty sold by their families, these youths were sent abroad, transported over the Mediterranean or over land in Central Asia to be sold to various emirs, mamliks, beys, and sultans. Boys were chosen on account of their physical strength, health, and appearance, with beauty often specified as a necessity for the boys who may adorn the Sultan's palace. Once purchased, these boys were converted to Islam and given the finest training in military matters, often with top-of-the-line equipment, weapons and horses, in addition to receiving education and even salaries. The result was a core of fierce warriors loyal not to previously existing political or family ties, but to their fellow Ghulams and their master, who sheltered and provided for them. Depending on the area, some were even taught Arabic as well as administrative and bureaucratic skills, though in the early generations of the Egyptian Mamluks, only select units appear to have reliably received such language education. The Ayyubid dynasty of Saladin was one of the many Islamic states that made great use of Ghulams and Mamluks in their wars to retake the Holy Land from the Crusaders. After Saladin's death in 1193, his empire was increasingly split amongst his heirs and descendants. Asili Ayyub, a grandson of Saladin's brother Al-Adil, became Sultan of Ayyubid Egypt in 1240, and seeking to rely on more reliable military elements, began greatly expanding his Mamluk regiments. He was fortunate, for there was a steady stream of slaves on the market at that moment. Far to the north in the Great Eurasian steppes, since the 1220s, the expansion of the Mongol Empire had been displacing a great many peoples, particularly of the Turkic Kuman Kipchak in the steppes, stretching from the Aral Sea to the Carpathians. Many raiders, 
seeking to take advantage of the instability, sold the children of the fleeing Kipchak to traders in Crimea, making their way to Egypt. With the price for good Turkic children dropping, As-Sali bought as many as he could, heaping training and arms upon them. Many hundreds, if not thousands, of Kipchaks, Kumen, Kangli, and others were arriving in Egypt from the 1220s through to the 1240s, and As-Sali created several garrisons of Mamluks around Cairo. Each garrison took its own identity and name for its location. The most famous were called the Bariya, so named for the island in the Nile their garrison occupied. The first test of the new Ayyubid Mamluk army was against the forces of King Louis IX in the Seventh Crusade, which invaded Egypt in 1249, which was to be the impetus for their own rise to power. The French king had hoped to take Cairo and use it as a base from which to retake Jerusalem, and had unknowingly made good timing. Soon after his arrival, Sultan as Salih Ayyub succumbed to illness. As Louis and his knights moved down the Nile from the coast, the Ayyubid leadership was embroiled in a power dispute, an alliance forming between the top military man Fakr al-Din, the vizier, and a widow of Sultan as Salih, Sajjar al-Dur. In a macabre facade, they pretended as Salih was still alive, having meals sent to him and signing papers in his name. In February 1250, a surprise early morning cavalry charge by Louis' troops resulted in the death of Fakr al-Din, but pursuing the survivors into the fortified site of Mansura led the crusaders right into the Bariya Mamluks. It was a slaughter. 600 knights entered, only a handful straggled out. The Seventh Crusade fell apart in the following weeks, and in April the Mamluks captured King Louis, quite literally asking for a king's ransom. The Mamluks not only led the counterattack that defeated the Crusader troops, but had captured the French king. Coupled with their pride at being the military elite, they quickly proved to be a dangerous element within the fragile strings that Ayyubid rulership still clung to. As-Sali's son, Al-Muazzam Taran Shah, arrived in Egypt to succeed his late father, only to be assassinated a few days after the capture of King Louis by the leader of the Bariya Mamluks, Agte. By May 1250, As-Sali's widow, Sajjar al-Dur, was appointed as sultan, and considered by some to be the first Mamluk sultan, though she was not a Mamluk and was a figurehead. Her brief tenure as sultan ended after only a few months, when she was forced to marry an emir named Ibeg, who was in turn forced by the Bariya Mamluks to take on a child Ayyubid puppet sultan. In the glow of the great victory at Mansura, the political situation became tenuous. In Syria, a great-grandson of Saladin, named An nasir Yusuf, took power in Damascus and even invaded Egypt, reaching the suburbs of Cairo before the Mamluks pushed him back in winter 1250. By 1252, the restless Amir Ibeg replaced the child sultan with another child, and in 1254, Ibeg and one of his own Mamluks, Kutuz, assassinated the Bariya Mamluk chief Akte, decapitating him and throwing his severed head out of the palace to the other Bariya Mamluks below. The rest of the Bariya Mamluks fled Egypt under Akte's second-in-command, Bebaz al-Bandukdari. Bebaz was a proud and courageous warrior, highly skilled and a close friend to Akte. The murder of Akte filled him with vengeance, and Bebaz spent the rest of the 1250s hopping between the Ayyubid princes of Damascus, Anasir Yusuf, and Karak al Mar, encouraging both to invade Egypt and overthrow Ibeg and Kutuz. The efforts were unsuccessful, and in the end, Bebaz was denied his revenge against Ibeg, for Shajar al-Dur had him assassinated in 1257. Ibeg's supporters soon killed her. The emirs fought for control of the child sultan, with the Mamluk Kutuz emerging as the dominant power. Maintaining the puppet sultan, Kutuz was the real power behind the throne for two years, until 1259, when news came of the approach of the Mongol prince Hulagur and his army into Syria. That November, Kutuz removed the boy sultan and took the title himself. Now ruling openly, Kutuz found himself the only power against whom Hulagur had left to march. Meanwhile in Syria, Bebaz al Dari and his followers were in Damascus, in the court of the Ayyubid prince An Nasir Yusuf, as Hulagu approached the Euphrates River. Bebaz urged An Nasir Yusuf to confront the advancing Mongols as they crossed the river. But An Nasir refused, trusting instead in the walls of Aleppo and Damascus, despite sending antagonizing messages to the Mongols and reneging on the tribute he had sent them since 1243. Some members of his court encouraged the Sultan to maintain the relationship with the Mongols, 
which only worsened Andesir's vacillating nature. Baybars, in his frustration to urge Andesir into resistance, on at least one occasion physically beat the chief proponent of peace in Andesir's court in a bout of frustration. Baybars knew overly trusting in the fortifications was foolish. The approaching Mongol army was led by Hulagur, whose great hosts had taken the great Ismaili fortresses and sacked Baghdad in 1258. While Aleppo and Damascus were well fortified, Baybars knew Andesir Yusuf's leadership was too weak, and the submission of Cilician Armenia and the Crusader county of Tripoli to the Mongols meant the Ayyubids had no local allies. Baybars and his regiments thus abandoned Andesir Yusuf and fled for Egypt. The decision was wise. While Baybars was a highly skilled professional soldier and never short on courage or vigor, he always read a military situation with a clear head. And Baybars knew that the great army that had overrun everything east as far as the rising sun would be undaunted by a man of wavering courage and little resolution like Andesir Yusuf. Andesir soon fled too, and Aleppo fell in less than a week to Hulagu and his Christian subjects, King Hegem I of Cilician Armenia and Duke Bermond VI of Antioch and Tripoli. By the start of March, Damascus was in Mongol hands, and soon after, Andesir Yusuf was captured. Bebaz al Bandukdari and his followers came to a truce with their foe Kutuz in Egypt and found shelter there. By the start of September 1260, only Cairo stood against the Mongol advance. Kutuz and Bebaz, despite their mutual dislike for each other, put aside their differences and began forming a plan against the Mongols, espousing a deliberate antagonistic policy. Kutuz, taking advantage of his origins as a Kangli from Central Asia, encouraged claims that he was in fact a descendant of Jalal al-Din Mingburnu, a Khwarezmian prince famous for his resistance against the Mongols some 40 years prior. Their efforts were ultimately rewarded with their victory at Ain Jalut in spring 1260, as we have covered in detail in earlier videos. Kutuz and Baybars pushed the Mongols back over the Euphrates and set about gaining submission of regional princes, rewarding those like al-Ashraf Musa who had allied with them or punishing those who had allied with the Mongols. Kutuz was not long to enjoy his victory. Baybars had not forgotten his hatred for Kutuz, and it seems there was some competition between the two over who deserved the most credit for the victory. Baybars orchestrated an assassination during the march back to Cairo. According to the account written by Baybars's chancellor and favored biographer Ibn Abd al-Zahir, Baybars's sword, rightly guided by Allah, struck down Kutuz. Given the proximity of Ibn Abd al-Zahir to Baybars, it seems likely this was the version of events approved by Baybars himself, emphasizing how no others took part in the murder. However, later accounts written after Baybars' death began adding new details, adding more participants and resistance on the part of Kutuz, giving Baybars only the killing blow. Whatever the truth of the day, the only consistent detail remains Baybars' direct involvement in the death of his predecessor. Returning to Cairo, Baybars was enthroned as Sultan, legitimized through his victories as well as a newly established puppet Caliph, a scion of the House of Abbas who had survived the fall of Baghdad. With Baybars' enthronement, the new Mamluk Sultanate was secured. After the upheavals of the 1250s, Baybars' 17-year-long reign proved a period of stability and allowed the Mamluks not only to weather the storm of the Mongols, but to rule Egypt, Syria, and the holy cities of Mecca and Medina until the 16th century. But Baybars failed only in establishing his own dynasty. His hopes for his sons, al Said Baraka and Sulamish, to rule after him were dashed, as both youths were forced to abdicate and flee, as one of Baybars's own Mamluks, Kalawun, established his own dynasty instead. The House of Kalawun would, on and off, rule the Mamluks of Egypt until the late 14th century. For more on how Baybars solidified his new dynasty and fought against the Mongols, be sure to watch our previous videos on how the Mamluks defended against the Mongols. We will continue talking about the Mamluks and Mongols in future episodes, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see them. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content, Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.